Welcome, everyone. We are thrilled to have you all tonight at Crackpot. Uh, please find your seats. We are getting started. Do, do, do. Uh, again, welcome to Crackpot. I am Isolde Honoré. I'm one of the partners here at Odd Salon. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, if you're paying attention to tonight's playbill, you may notice that I am not Trey, who was originally curating tonight's evening. Unfortunately, she is feeling unwell and could not join us. So I would like for all of us to collectively wish her well in a Crackpot style. Ships to Trey. I have in my hands a healing amethyst, which is a crystal with the most healing properties. So I would like all of you, the audience, to focus your minds, tap into the energy grid of this crystal, and mentally, mentally wish that Trey feels better soon. Take a moment. <laughs> Message received. Thank you so much. <laughs> Enough with the crack pottery. On to crack pot. I literally don't know what is happening in this slide, but I like it. <laughs> I am delighted to usher you all through an evening of mad scientists, qu questionable pseudo scientific theory, <laughs> pseudoscience, improbable art. Er Erratic behavior <laughs> and defied conventions. I would like to find out with a show of hands who here is new? Anyone here for the first time? Okay. Well, welcome. As you may have already figured out, we're a pretty enthusiastic group here and we have a lot of callbacks. So if you're feeling particularly witty or drunk enough to think that you're witty, uh, feel free to join in and uh, enthusiastically encourage the speakers. So here at Odd Salon, we are experts and amateurs together who explore the weird stories found in history, science, art, and adventure over cocktails. And the great news is our community is always growing and we're always looking for new voices and new perspectives to come up here on the stage and deliver history, art, and science in a new way. So you can join us. Uh, we can be found in all the typical social media ways. Uh, you can find us, you can like Odd Salon on Facebook, join our Something Weird group on Facebook, which is where the discussion happens. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram. And if you'd like to sign up to speak, please go to oddsalon.com backslash speak uh, and let us know what are your topics of expertise. We also have a guest book over at the merch table, so you can sign up to be on our mailing list through them. Anyway, on to Crackpots. Crackpot means a few things today. It can mean a crazy or eccentric person, or it can be an adjective that describes a baseless, disprovable idea or pseudoscientific theory, which happen to be some of my favorite theories. Interestingly enough, even though crackpot means crazy, that's the, that's the number one definition that comes up with crackpot, Crackpot and crazy are linguistic cognates. They share an entomology. They both come from the root word cracked, which is a 16th century concept or a metaphor for physical damage of, of a person, oops, physical damage of a person leading to bizarre behavior. Now, I found in a 1611 dictionary of English and French translations a most delightful collection of insults to, to um, French, uh, <laughs> to uh, describe the condition of estropié de caboche, which uh, in my literal translation would be uh, lame in the noggin. In English, this translates in 1611 to frantic, witless, brain sick, and brain cracked. So brain cracked is the root of crackpot. So from, crack, from brain cracked, that turns into the cutthroat word crack brain. Ooh, cutthroats. I don't know if Brianne is here tonight, but hello. I learned something from her. Uh, from Crack Brain, we have Cracked Pate, and then uh, Pot was a synonym or a, a slang word for 
for, or pot was a slang word for pate, so from crack pate, crack pot. But what does it mean? I, crazy is not a very good descriptor. Number one, it's a pejorative term, not a diagnosis. Uh, so what does someone mean when they say, oh, that person's crazy? What they're saying is that person is bizarre, weird, or different. Uh, so tonight, in the spirit of crackpots, I want to revere the eccentric, someone who exhibits behavior outside of prescribed cultural norms. So, by way of tonight's invocation, I want to introduce you to my favorite weirdy beardy philosopher eccentric, a philosopher who rejected social norms in a deliberate, calculated, and demonstrably public way to lambaste the absurdity of social norms. May I introduce you to Diogenes of Sinope. Some of you are familiar. He was a man who chose to live a socially divergent life, thus illustrating the hypocrisy of social conventions and mores. Not much is known about his early life. He seemed to have just fully formed into being as a crotchety old man. Uh, but we do know that he fled to Athens on the heels of an accusation of currency debas debasement in Sinope. Uh, when he did end up in Athens, he was fairly disgusted with the Athenian lifestyle of excess, and to make a public point about it, he chose to live in a discarded barrel in the marketplace. So here he is, just your typical neighborhood grump in, in Athens, irascible, living in poverty, eccentric, yet somehow beloved by locals. How is this possible? How could anyone love someone like that? <laughs> also, as part of his public commitment to be virtuous, he also swore off material possessions. Avoiding materialism is a common thread across many philosophies and religions, often tied to ideals like humility, contentment, finding inner peace. However, for Diogenes, it was more fueled by, let's say, contempt. <laughs> Fuck all of your stuff. Now, to give you a little explanation of his beliefs and why it was so different, I want to give you a little explanation of the lineage of philosophy in, in Greece at the time. So many beards. So it all started with Socrates. Uh, it, it, those of you who are familiar with history, spoilers, Socrates acting in ways different than cultural norms did not end well for him. Anyone want to yell out the spoiler? Yeah, he, he was forced to drink hemlock uh, because he was branded a heretic. Uh, but anyway, bef before he, he left, he had a few disciples. Uh, one of the, he had many, but uh, two who come up in the story is, are Antith uh, An Anisthenes and Plato. And Anisthenes founded the school of cynicism, which is not huffy eye rolling or dis disaffected vocal fry, but it instead it is a school of thought that proposes that living life in agreement with nature uh, is the way to go and that you only make do with the bare necessities. This means rejecting any desires for health, wealth, power, or fame. Uh, the cynics believed that greed was the cause of human suffering, thereby, fo thereby following a strict ethical code to live a simple life uncluttered by ownership of material goods. So uh, Antisthenes founded the school and Diogenes became its champion and very quickly uh, wanted to live by the, the principles of cynicism and, and was one of the most famous cynics. Now, uh, Antisthenes declared that he would take no pupils. So Diogenes was determined to be a pupil and he approached him and was like, oh, I, 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 I love your, your school of thought, please be my master. Uh, Antisthenes beat him off with a cane. And so Diogenes the next day came back and was like, I want to be your pupil. And, and then the master beat him off with a cane. And this happened numerous times, which shows Diogenes' level of commitment, which is, I don't want anything that badly. Um, but so anyway, and, and Thisthenes, worn out by Diogenes' request, eventually relented and agreed to, to uh, share his, his school and philosophy with him. So another disciple of Socrates was Plato, who Diogenes thought was a great big jerk. That's another story. Uh, but, so basically he felt, Diogenes felt that Plato was not correctly interpreting Socratic principles, and he vehemently disagreed with Plato's philosophies. 
In turn, Plato thought that Diogenes was absolutely batshit insane and perverting Socratic principles and also just like a big, filthy, obscene, gross person. Uh, so he publicly labeled Diogenes a Socrates gone mad, just this perversion of Socratic principle. Additionally, Plato was fawned upon by the Athenian public. He had tons of social capital and celebrity, all things that Diogenes had sworn off. So Diogenes again and again is accused of being mad, which is something that he addresses and points out. It is not that I am mad, it is only that my head is different from yours. So again, playing into this notion that eccentricity is not an affliction, it's just, it's just a, con a conditional. Uh, so he again is labeled mad for acting against convention, but he seeks to point out that it's the conventions that lack reason. So again, he, he committed to living these principles in a public way uh, to, to demonstrate to the public how they should live virtuously. Uh, and he publicly challenged social mores and, and publicly declared a, uh, a desire to be shameless. He declared that if an act is not shameful in private, then it should not be shameful in public. Now it should be noted at this time in Athens that eating in public was considered very taboo. So Diogenes challenged this notion by purposefully eating in the marketplace where he purchased his food. And when people asked him, why are you doing this? He said, well, I eat when I feel hungry. Uh, he would also take this further and he would urinate in the marketplace. And people would say, well, why are you doing this? That's inappropriate. And he said, well, I relieve myself when I, when I have to. And most regrettably, Oh, you know what's coming. He'd satisfy other urges in the marketplace as well. So, you know, take matters into his own hand, shall we say. <laughs> now, as you can imagine, this is still horrifying thousands of years later. And at the time, this was pretty horrifying to the Athenian populace. And so they'd be like, why are you doing this? And he replied, if only it were as easy to banish hunger by rubbing my belly. <laughs> Weirdo. <laughs> now, I mentioned that Diogenes basically hated Plato, who was a great big jerk. So Diogenes trolled him relentlessly. At Plato's lectures, when people would fawn upon him and praise his wit and listen captivated to everything that Plato had to say, because, oh, his philosophy was so wise, Diogenes would roll up to the lecture, and I mentioned how it's taboo to eat in public, He'd come to the lecture, armed with crunchy snacks, <laughs> whereupon he would smack, chew, slobber as loud as he possibly could to the point of disrupting Plato's train of thought. Uh, now, all of you who have, have uh, pie tonight, we don't frown on that, so go ahead and Pam Poovy style, just get into that, nom, 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 nom. totally fine. Now, another thing, great big jerk Plato, uh, to great renown, he had defined the human being as an animal, biped, uh, biped, and featherless. And everyone in Athens thought that this was absolutely brilliant. Uh, Diogenes was not so impressed with this uh, definition. So again, rolled up to the lecture with a plucked chicken in hand and yelled, Behold, Plato's man! So then Plato, great big jerk, whoop, redefined the human being as an animal, biped and featherless, but with broad toenails. Jerk. <laughs> do, do, oh. There we go. Uh, so unfortunately, Diogenes' writings didn't survive. It's thought that he had a great many deal or a great many writings on his philosophies, but uh, they, didn't, they did not survive him. And what we know about him is from everyone else writing about him. He was like that wacky party guy that everyone has an anecdote about. Like, hey, did you hear that one time that Diogenes did this thing? No, that was amazing. So uh, one, one of the legends, which may or may not have happened, was, hey, did you hear about that time that he was invited into Plato's home for dinner and he was told very sternly that it was polite company so he must not spit in the spittoon? Well, he looked Plato in the eye and spat on the floor. Then there was that other time that Diogenes ran through a bunch of mud puddles, broke into Plato's house, and ran cackling through the house 
into the bedroom, whereupon he jumped up and down on the bed sheets and all of the linens and floor coverings. Ha ha. Remember, Plato's the jerk in, in, in Diogenes' philosophy. So, I also want to point out he had one last great big adventure, crazy eccentric. He was traveling from Athens to the island of Aegina, and lo and behold, pirates captured the ship, and they took him to... They shipped into Crete, dropped him off to be sold as a slave, whereupon Xeniades, a resident of Corinth, purchased him, and amused by his wit and moxie, he said some brilliant things there on the slave stand that don't really translate into English but are hilarious, took, to, took him back to Corinth to tutor his children, whereupon he became a beloved member of the family uh, and, and was freed. And he eventually fell into his old ways of, of publicly declaring that uh, materialism was shameful, and he ended up in Corinth living in a wooden tub, because that's, that's his MO. So there he was, in his wooden discard trash can, in the public market, enjoying the sun. Alexander the Great had heard about Diogenes' principles and was delighted to meet, uh, to meet Diogenes. So they, they conferred for a while, and then Alexander the Great, most powerful man in Greece at the time, asked very seriously if he could bestow Diogenes a favor. Most powerful man in the world says that he wants to grant you a favor. Diogenes looked him in the eye and said, yes, take a step to the right, you're blocking my son. Ooh. This impressed the hell out of Alexander the Great. Who, who then said, if I were not Alexander, then I should wish to be Diogenes. So his death is also, the details of his death are not very well known because again, none of his writings survived, but his memory lives on precisely because of his prestige as an eccentric and even his death was reported in eccentric ways. Now probably he lived very happily in Corinth and died of extreme old age because people loved him and took care of him, but uh, there are all these stories of, oh, I heard he ate a raw octopus and then died of food poisoning. Oh, I heard a dog bit him and he crawled into a cave and died of an affected bite. No, I heard that he held his breath until he died. So all, all of these are, are written down and different theories, but again, uh, his actions and his eccentricity, eccentricity live on because it was so divergent uh, uh, from what else was happening in Athens at the time. Now, last week in her talk, Anetta talked about how jerks and history go hand in hand. And so too is history filled with eccentric crackpots. The exceptional, the weird, the bizarre, the people who just, the, the square pegs and the round holes. We don't remember the timid. We don't remember the normal. But instead, we remember the people who stood up for their principles, whether or not they were misguided. So. I would also like to invite the idea that history is filled with crackpots. And on that idea, I want to go to the words of another philosopher, John Stuart Mill. And he writes in 1859 uh, in, his, in his text, On Liberty, he writes about rebelling against the tyranny of the majority. And he says, in this age, the mere example of nonconformity, the mere refusal to bend the knee to custom, is itself a service. Precisely because the tyranny of opinion is such as to make eccentricity a reproach, it is desirable. In order to break through that tyranny, that people should be eccentric. Eccentricity has always abounded when and where strength of character has abounded, and the amount of eccentricity in a society has generally been proportional to the amount of genius, mental vigor, and moral courage which is contained. So that so, that so few now dare to be eccentric marks the chief danger of the time. So, I would like to toast all of the irrepressible oddballs of history that bring color to all of our stories, because that's really what we are uh, about tonight. So a toast to the, to the eccentrics. Now, with more stories of square pegs and round holes, please join me in welcoming all of tonight's speakers, Crystal Riley, John Adams, 
Michael Salazzo. And joining us on stage for the first time, we have three new speakers, Ray, Ray Robitaille, Janiah Stroud, and John Brecht. So to start us out tonight with a pseudoscientific crackpot theory and adventure, uh, we have John Adams with Adams on Adams, Journey to the Center of the Earth. Oh, this is, <clears throat> there we go. Hello, a microphone. Almost like I'm a sound guy. You think I know what I'm doing. All right, so I am an Adams. No, not this kind of Adams. I mean, fine, I've been known to go to some goth clubs, but this kind of an Adams. I'm from Boston. Uh, I still have family in Massachusetts, and five generations ago, a split in the family tree moved my family away from the presidential lineage, but we're close enough by blood. I want to tell you a story about how one of my ancestors was duped by a crackpot named John Cleve Symes, who was born in 1780 in New Jersey. He was named after his uncle who fought in the American Revolutionary War. Sims himself fought in the War of 1812, after which he moved to St. Louis, Missouri, established a trading post which wasn't very good, never made a lot of money, and he wasn't a great trader. He was never formally taught science. There we go. But he immersed himself by reading books in the natural sciences. And by 1818, he was publicizing his version of the hollow earth, which he believed to have concentric spheres and receive light and warmth through large holes in the planet open at each of the poles. And the crazy part is, is that, you know, uh, there we go. So Sims detailed his ideas in this 1818 manifesto, which he distributed to 500 institutions, including philosophical societies, colleges, foreign rulers, governments, anyone that would listen, including American politicians. Um, he also sent it to natural philosophers throughout the United States and Europe, and despite having attached each, on each copy of this document that he sent out, which we'll see in just a moment, he attached a certificate to attest his sanity. The, cir <laughs> the circular was, according to his son Americus, overwhelmed with ridicule as the product of a distempered imagination. Sims even wrote a book under a pseudonym. He proved relentless in publicizing these views. As a prolific lecturer, a writer of letters and articles, he wrote fictional accounts on the hollow earth, including this book called Simsonia, Voyage of Discovery. This came out in about 1820, and he may have published this under the pseudonym Adam uh, Seaborn, and he advocated expeditions to the Poles. Adam Seaborn, really? Dumb name. Um, he thought the hollow earth was illuminated by these openings, and, and the, this idea became incredibly popular and one that would be tested as more and more and more humans struggled to reach the poles. And, you know, he made wild claims about what one would find in the center of the, of the hollow earth, and I'm not saying he thought that we'd find aliens there, but it could have been aliens. He described the people inside the earth as being so white they were translucent, probably with privilege as well. Um, <laughs> hey -o. Go figure. And while they had apparently no knowledge of optics, they could fly. The fictional book about this journey was about as close as Sims was ever going to get to making it. And despite his best efforts, you know, they were very good. But he had the backing of this very, very wealthy backer named James McBride, who had made a fortune as a surveyor, and he was ready to spend that money on anything that he saw fit. McBride basically took him off of the lecture circuit and got him into Washington. The earliest known reference to this theory is in a written letter from Sims to his stepson, uh, Anthony Lockwood, dated um, August 17th, 1817. And he said, from the curious formation of Saturn, I infer that all planets and globes are hollow. Of course, he doesn't elaborate on what the science could be. He has no idea how this works. But the comment is almost certainly a reference to Jean-Jacques uh, Desmarins' uh, theory of the origin of Saturn's rings, which pretty much said the same thing. Uh, Symes had access to, to Rees' uh, encyclopedia book, which accounts this hypothesis, and that the ring remnant was an outer shell that had somehow collapsed. Total bullshit. Um, <laughs> He even proposed that the Appalachian Mountains, which were conveniently located near to where he was living, were remnants of a collapsed ring that once encircled the Earth. <laughs> Total bullshit. Um, the circular in which Sims first detailed this, this is the actual document that he sent out, uh, it was called Circular Number 1, and it, it appeared in U.S. Uh, newspapers in April 1818. It was addressed to all the world. He sent it to over 500 institutions in an attempt to inform the world of both the declaration and intent of his travels. He also selected a number of protectors, which he called them protectors, they were just really bad scientists of the time, and deeply representative of the non-pseudoscientific mindset that they would have had. 
um, including Dr. S.L. Mitchell, Sir H. Davey, and, and, and others. Um, and of course, the most recent time we saw something like this happen was uh, on August 2nd, 2007, where a Russian submarine descended 14,000 feet at the North Pole, planted a titanium flag on the Arctic seafloor because, well, climate change. Um, and this move, this move pretty much angered the press because it was effectively like firing the starting gun on the world's last colonial scramble for the Arctic because the Arctic is rich in oil and gas, the resources are increasingly accessible as the polar ice caps melt, and Russia's, uh, Russia's actions were, were designed to kind of lay the groundwork for its claim to 460,000 square uh, miles of submerged land. Uh, of course, the flag planting pissed everyone off, including the Canadians, who said, you just can't go and plant a flag, or can you? A comedy routine by the British performer Eddie Izzard dramatizes a similar response to such imperialistic moves. In Dress to Kill in 1999, Izzard focuses on Britain's activities in the 18th and 19th century, where, where, uh, wherein they stole countries with the cunning use of flags. Just sail around the world, stick a flag in it, and say, I claim India for Britain. And they're going, you can't claim us, we live here. There's 500 million of us. Do you have a flag? We don't need a flag. We, but we have a flag and this gun to back it up. Anyway, back to Sims. Um, his initial vision of the Earth's interior was like a simplified model of Halley's multi-layered model. With the, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I, I really had to resist the urge to put Goatsy in this talk. <laughs> I know, I know, sorry. It ha I know, I know, this is going to be really bad. Um, anyway, so it actually turned out that the way that they described a folly, they would say that you are, were in a Sims hole. So, in his, yeah, yeah, I know. In his first declaration, he proposed to mount an expedition to the North Pole where they were sure to find one of the apertures and, and gain access to the inner Earth. This wasn't the first time this happened, though, because Edmund Haley had proposed it. Um, numerous uh, people like Galileo had proposed the, that the Earth was hollow and that everything was spheres and, and what have you. So, that really wasn't true. Um, anyway, um, there was also this very strange thing where Symes felt that the Germans had already made it in there. And in, the middle and in the Middle Ages, an ancient German myth uh, held that some mountains between Eisenach and Jin Germany held a portal to the inner earth, and a Russian legend said that the uh, Samyeds, an ancient Siberian tribe, had also made it already. And there was also in the 1920s this thing called the Thule Society about a German occultist and, and, uh, and people's group in Munich named after a mythical northern country from Greek legend. Now, uh, I, I direct you to uh, this incredibly true and amazing documentary. Uh, <laughs> Because uh, I don't think they went to the middle of the Earth, I actually think they were on the dark side of the moon. But anyway. Uh, and, you know, of course, even today, in this idiotic 1996 website, we still see people talking about the Earth being hollow. It wouldn't be the first time, you know? Anyway. The thing about Sims is he was actually able to convince John Adams, my somewhere great ancestor, to fund his expedition to the, to the hole. And, Adams, uh, he, he got the best of Mr. Adams, and Adams said yes to the funding. And as a result of the decision of the House of Representatives, uh, he was president. This, now, this is not John Adams Sr., this is John Quincy Adams, the, you know, his son, second and sixth presidents there. Um, he was uh, a not well-liked president, not unlike the time we live in now. Um, and then eventually, Andrew Jackson came along because Jackson was the next president who defeated him, getting so many votes that he was actually able to take the funding away from uh, this terribly stupid project. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, like his, he, he did have supporters, and they, they, certainly, they certainly helped him along the way, and even putting out this, uh, this book about what would have been found there. Um, Jeremiah Reynolds uh, wrote this book, and this book eventually sort of became the, the impetus for Moby Dick. Um, also, uh, he may have influenced Ed Edgar uh, Allan Poe as well. And um, Reynolds gave this very impassioned speech, which allowed him to get funding, because he gave this speech in front of the House of Representatives. And of course, Jackson came by again. Jackson said, nope, we're not going to pay you. Well, nope. <laughs> but, but here's the great part, and here's, here's, here's how we will close this out. Um, the wonderful thing about the work that, that he had done, that Symes had done, even though his work was completely full of shit and terrible, um, he was able to get the United States to actually begin polar exploration. And Adams was able to take the money, which did not go to this exploration, and he was able to build a naval observatory in Washington, D.C., which was very successful and got Adams deeply involved in the sciences and allowed Adams to convince James, science, yes, science, yes, 
and allowed Adams to convince James Smithson to take his money and give it to the government to start the Smithsonian Institution. So even though the journey never happened, Adams did eventually find a more useful way to advance knowledge of the natural world. And it's thanks to these institutions that we know what the truth is. The picture of the structure of the Earth that's been arrived at through the study of seismic waves is quite different from the hollow Earth hypothesis. The time it takes for a seismic wave to travel from one end of the world to the other tells us what the structure of the Earth is, and we can detect these waves using seismographs and computers. So I want to raise a toast to my ancestor, John Adams, and I want to raise a toast to Jackson for not funding him, because without that, we wouldn't have had this, and also to science. Lions. Yeah, scientific theories are only crackpot theories if they're found out to be wrong, but it takes a lot of creativity to try anything new. So hooray right, for, for crackpots. So next, uh, please welcome to the stage, it is her first time speaking with us, uh, Ray Robitaille. She is going to talk about St. Anthony's Fire and Le Pain Maudit, the Cursed Bread. Good evening. Tonight, I'm going to tell you the story of a character who's had quite an impact on history. They were present at the Salem Witch Trials and the Bubonic Plague. They inspired a nonstop medieval dance party. They heavily influenced the Summer of Love. And they even have a relationship with the CIA. But before we get into all of that, we need to go back, way back, to the year 1039. An epidemic is spreading across parts of Europe. Peasants are convulsing in the streets, entering into mad hallucinations. They describe a prickling sensation in their limbs. Some think insects are crawling under their skin. And it's not just hallucinations. Some of them lose the feeling in their extremities entirely, and they have to have their hands or feet removed. And people are dying at an alarming rate. St. Anthony's Parish is converted into a dedicated hospital for these patients, whose symptoms so often include the description that their body feels like it's on fire, that the illness is dubbed St. Anthony's Fire. And the care and healthy diet that they receive in the hospital seems to be effective. People get better, they're released, they return home, only to fall ill again. One doctor notices a pattern in how the disease is spreading. It's more common among people from the lower class. It tends to be more prevalent among people who live in colder, wet conditions. Oh, and there's this one other thing. When the doctor makes house calls, he sees the same thing on everyone's table. Rye bread. The villain. And this is where the source of their illness is hiding. So now that you've met some of its victims, allow me to formally introduce you to Ergot. Ergot is a parasitic fungus that grows upon cereal grains, and rye is especially susceptible. So anyone drinking rye whiskey in the crowd tonight, you may wish to pay close attention to this talk. <laughs> You're safe. You're safe. It thrives in damp conditions and in cooler climates. And it's a pest with a clever disguise. It attacks its host and replaces some of the original grains with some of its own germination structures, known as sclerotium. The sclerotium are the darker bits of the plant that you'll see behind me. So it's clearly visible to the naked eye, but it was so common in certain regions that people centuries ago just thought that's how rye sometimes looked. And frankly, even if they realized something was up, a peasant wasn't going to have the resources to track down a healthier food source. And that's unfortunate, because if this fungus isn't removed before the grain is harvested, it's milled into the flour, and if consumed, results in a very extreme food poisoning known as ergotism. And ergotism has quite a legacy. To dig into that legacy a bit more, we'll hop forward a few centuries to the 1600s. The winter leading into 1692 was especially wet and dreary, and things were getting pretty spooky in Salem, Massachusetts. People were 
entering into spouts of dementia, ranting and raving as if possessed. Children were convulsing into inhuman shapes. What could possibly be causing this insanity? Obviously, <laughs> the town was full of witches. <laughs> or not. It turns out the disease that was making people feel like their bodies, was on fi bodies were on fire was actually causing people to be burned at the stake. Some of the evidence implicating Urgot in the Salem witch trials include examinations of the diaries from the town's residents that show that they were unusually dependent on rye as a food source that year because the other crops had not survived the harsh winter. And these bewitched, unusual behaviors lasted only the duration that it would have taken for them to consume this infected grain, after which those symptoms abruptly ended. Maps of where the bewitched victims lived show that they were significantly more likely to live in the areas where Urgot would thrive. And it wasn't just the people in those households that were affected. Their pets were exhibiting strange behaviors. Their livestock was dropping dead unexpectedly. It's very sad. <laughs> and the effect that ergots had on animals has also had its own significant role in history, including playing an indirect role in spreading the plague. To be clear, the plague is spread through the bites of infected fleas as they prey on their victims, commonly rats, enter ergot. <laughs> rats that ate the infected grain would experience the same toxic results that a human would, including death, and more dead rats equals more opportunities for the plague to spread. Urgot's also been accused of playing a role in the dancing manias of the Middle Ages, in which hundreds of people took to the streets, unable to stop dancing. They convulsed hypnotically, unable to stop even to eat or sleep. I know this sounds like a medieval rave, <laughs> but it was pretty unpleasant, and people were dancing to their deaths. There are many theories about what could have caused these dancing manias, and Urgot is one of the suspects. So luckily for us, there are many processes in place to prevent the spread of ergotism today. So our friends drinking rye whiskey, you'll be delighted to know that the fungus is killed off in the distillation process. Keep drinking. <laughs> Additionally, the fields are tilled much more deeply so that any remaining spores won't have a chance to spread because they'll be buried. And a field that's growing a crop that's susceptible to ergot will be replaced the following season with a crop that's not susceptible, so no stragglers can find a new host. Yet despite these measures, the small French village of Pont Saint-Esprit saw a familiar scene emerge in the 1950s. What started with cases of nausea and insomnia quickly turned into hallucinations and convulsions. A man ran through the street screaming, I am dead, my head is made of copper, I have snakes in my belly and they are burning me! <laughs> Before throwing himself in the river. Another man jumped from a second story window, breaking both of his legs and yet getting up and continuing to run on, ranting and raving for another 50 yards. Within 48 hours, over 200 villagers became violently ill and several died. Multiple buildings were converted into asylums. The epidemic was referred to as pain maudit, which is French for cursed bread. <laughs> so after so many years of successful ergotism prevention, how could there be another outbreak? Well, to get there, let's dig a little bit further into the symptoms of ergotism. And the exact symptoms will vary based on the specific mix of alkaloids in a given batch of infected grain, but they'll fall into two main categories. <clears throat> the first is gangrenous ergotism, which results in constricted blood vessels, a loss of peripheral sensations, and a swelling caused by excess fluid in the body's tissues. But the one I want to draw your attention to is convulsive ergotism, which results in shaking, delusions, hallucinations. Dance party. Exactly. <laughs> if any of those sound reminiscent of a certain counterculture movement in the 1960s, that's because two of the alkaloids in ergot, ergotamine and lysergic acid, are the chemicals that eventually resulted in the development of LSD. Science. <laughs> 
So it turns out we're not just dealing with cursed bread, we're dealing with psychedelic bread. So how do we get from moldy bread to a drug that I'm sure nobody in this room is familiar with? Well, so far, I've spoken mostly about the negative effects of ergot. But in fact, there have been medicinal uses for many years, the main one being to prevent excess bleeding after childbirth and also to ease the pain of migraines. And in the mid-1900s, a wave of research began to further explore other potential benefits. This was led by Sandoz Laboratories in Switzerland, and Albert Hoffman was a scientist there who was tasked with breaking down the compounds in ergot to explore these therapeutic use cases. One day in the midst of his research, he started feeling a little bit unusual. <laughs> he managed to make it safely home before experiencing what he described as a not unpleasant, intoxicated-like condition characterized by an extremely stimulated imagination. <laughs> Fairly accurate. It turns out that by isolating the compounds in ergot, he had unintentionally stumbled across a less gangrenous, yet still hallucinogenic derivative, LSD. He realized he must have absorbed some of the chemical through his skin. And clearly there was only one thing to do, try it again. <laughs> More science. Soon many of the scientists at Sandoz Laboratories were collaborating with Albert in his investigation of this new pharmaceutical. And in fact, Sandoz Laboratories started handing out free samples of LSD to the scientific community to explore the psychological benefits. Now, when the US government heard about this, they wanted in on the action, as you do. You see, the director of the CIA at the time was convinced that the Cold War was going to lead to a war of the minds, and he wanted a chemical weapon to better manipulate the mental state of the enemy. So, they started testing LSD on unsuspecting military personnel, trying to gauge its potential as a truth serum or as a way to induce a hysteria that would make it easier to attack an enemy. Some people theorize that the village of Pont Saint-Esprit was a victim of those tests and that the US government collaborated with Sandoz to intentionally dose the village to see what the impact would be on this grander scale. Others say that the French government was to blame for the outbreak because they were rationing flour after World War II, and the French would rather eat crazy bread than go without a baguette. <laughs> but we may never know what ultimately was behind the Pont Saint-Esprit outbreak. But we do know that ergot has played a dramatic role in history, for better or worse. So while I can't resist the temptation to propose a toast to psychedelic toast, <laughs> I suggest we also raise our glasses in respect of nature and the many discoveries that she has yet to reveal. Oh, ergot poisoning. Such a serious affliction, and yet I would really like an ergot rye bread poisoning sticker set. Those were adorable. Little, little witch rye bread. <laughs> Up next, we have more mad science. John Brecht, our, uh, also another first time speaker here, <laughs> is going to tell us all about electric frog legs and the secret of life. Hey everybody. Uh, so before I jump into this, I want to give a little warning. If this is bothersome to you, this, pres this presentation will include some depictions of severed frog legs. So, you know, now might be a time to uh, grab that drink, go to the bathroom if that sort of thing bothers you. But I promise it won't be that gory. So, please. So this story starts with uh, Luigi Aloisio Galvani, who was a uh, 
physician and anatomist working at the University of Bologna in the 18th century. And if the name Galvani sounds familiar, it's because, yes, it probably does ring some bells. His name has been associated with, yes, a wide variety of electrical phenomena. And yet, he's a physician and an anatomist, so why is he so, so associated with electricity? Well, that all starts with these electric frogs. So the story, as it was popular, popularly told at the time, is Galvani is in his lab. There's some electrical equipment around. His wife is there making a soup. She's cutting up some frog's legs. Soup. soup. Science soup. And so just as she's cutting into one of these frog's legs, the uh, spark machine discharges, and zzz, the frog's leg jerks. Science. 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 Except uh, that's all kind of bullshit. And that this was no accident. Galvani was actually quite intentionally experimenting in his laboratory, electrocuting frogs' legs. This was no new thing at the time. It was actually known for a while that if you apply a shock to a nerve, you can get a muscle to twitch. Galvani himself, while he was in medical school, actually witnessed a paralyzed man being sort of jerked to life by being electrocuted in just the right way. What Galvani's real breakthrough was, was this. He took a pair of frog's legs, cut off just above this, uh, just around the waist, stripped the skin away in order to expose the sciatic nerve, and then he took this special wand, an electrode, one end made of copper, one end made of zinc, and he showed that he could still make the frog's legs twitch. And so, it's alive. He has found... <laughs> Giovanni believes he's found a new secret of life here. Um, he spends the next five years, uh, along with his nephew, studying this phenomenon, and he eventually studies, and bear with me, de verbis electricitatis in motu musculari commentarius, or commentary on the effect of electricity on muscular motion. This is Galvani's great work. He has found, through these frog's legs, the secret of what makes muscles move, because we knew that muscles were the things that made us move, but what we didn't know is what made the muscles move. So Galvani publishes this great work, and his essential theory, his essential belief is that the brain produces electricity, that it sends out to the nerves, and that electricity eventually finds its way into the muscles, which allows them to flex. And he believes he's found this secret because he can make these muscles twitch and flex without any external device. Uh, the, so this charge sort of builds up, this charge that the brain has been sending into the muscles builds up and can later be released if you have the right magic wand. So Galvani brands this animal electricity to distinguish it from the sort of electricity uh, that was already well known to science by then, the sort of electricity that if you say rub a glass wand with some rabbit fur, you can shock your friend with. Um, animal electricity gets rebranded as galvanism. Galvanism becomes more modernly known as bioelectricity. And through this work, Galvani is rightly known as uh, essentially the founder of the field of electrophysiology. Now it should be added at this point parenthetically that yes, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley certainly had Galvani on her reading list in that stormy summer of 1816 when she and Lord Byron and her husband Percy had their ghost story writing contest. Um, but the whole spark-filled lab part, if you'll recall, was actually not a part of her story. That, that was added by Hollywood later. She was still interested, she was principally interested in the fact that Galvani really had found an apparent secret of life. He could bring these dead frogs back to life. So anyway, Back to Galvani's story, of course, a challenger approaches. His name is Alessandro Giuseppe Antonio Anastasio Volta. <laughs> so now Volta is an experimental physicist, and yes, he's that Volta for whom the Volta is named, and you know you've made it big in physics when a unit gets named after you and they lowercase it. Um, <laughs> So Volta, like uh, uh, many scientists at the time, uh, are enthusiastic about Galvani's work, and they have to reproduce it in their own labs, which he does, but he quickly questions the frog. 
Volta is not convinced by animal electricity. What he is convinced by is metal electricity. And what, what Volta eventually does is he makes a sandwich. This sandwich has one plate made of copper, one plate made of zinc, and sandwiched in between the two is not a frog, but in a physicist's approximation of a frog, which in this case is a brine-soaked piece of tissue paper. As it happens, you can generate electricity this way. What's nice about this sandwich is you can stack it up Dagwood style and make a really big sandwich <laughs> called a voltaic pile. This is our first battery. This opens up doorways uh, for the study of electricity uh, in, in, in the 19th century by, by physicists uh, in huge ways. But this gets us away from our story of Galvani because let's get back to his posse who says, no, 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 no. Uh, his nephew and another researcher, Marucci, they, they are really sure of this idea of animal electricity, so they respond with Volta's battery with batteries of their own made of frog's legs. <laughs> no, this is a legit thing. This is their, 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 their science battle. They, they literally, the frog... <laughs> so literally, the frog's leg battery is a thing. Yes, it's... <laughs> So literally, the frog's leg battery is a thing. They, they put these things end-to-end -to, -end to try to show they can generate more electricity with them. And it even gets to the point where his nephew, Aldini, yeah, I'm sorry about this. He <laughs> takes an ox's head that's been, he severs an ox's head, and he uh, gets his hands wet with salt water and shows that he can generate, he can make a battery out of an ox head. So surely animal electricity is a thing. Now, as it happens, the frog's leg battery goes nowhere, but I want you to note in this picture what Aldini is holding up to the tongue of this ox. Those are frog's legs. <laughs> What's important here, I give you the frog's leg galvanoscope. Scope meaning detector. What is huge about Galvani's discovery is not frog's legs, it, frog's leg as source of electricity, not frog's leg as battery, but frog's leg as detector. And the frog's leg galvanoscope is the state-of-the-art detector for small electrical currents for literally decades to come. This is legit science. This... And you're wondering, decades? Really? Was there nothing better discovered than this frog's leg wired up to... Well, yes. For sure, uh, we have the galvanometer that was discovered uh, about 20 years later. Um, not by Galvani, but named for Galvani because he was so well recognized in the field. The galvanometer is this device where you take a, a wire with some electrical current running through it, and it was observed that the more electrical current running through that wire, the more it would deflect a compass away from north. This, uh, as some of you may know, that electrical currents will generate magnetic fields. And so this feels a lot more legit, right? This is how you should measure electricity. And it was, but still, nonetheless, I mean, this quote from 1848, there's by orders of magnitude nothing better than the frog's leg of onoscope for studying these tiny currents until, bring the future calls. <laughs> Alexander Graham Bell brings us the telephone in 1876. Now, the telephone is this wonderful device that will convert sound into electricity, but more importantly, will turn electricity into sound, and that electricity doesn't have to have come from sound to begin with. So here we have this new amazing device for visualizing this invisible small electric currents. So here we have the true future of electrophysiology that, uh, along with the EEG. But nonetheless, we can't help but plug a frog's leg into this thing, right? <laughs> In 1877, the German physiologist Emil Henrik dubois Raymond produces the greatest quote I came across in all the work studying this thing, which is, it is easy to achieve a twitch by the current of the telephone. Evidently, the nerve seems to be more sensitive to some sounds than to others. If one calls out to him, jerk, the limb will jerk. On the first eye and lie still, it will not react. The sounds with deeper characteristic overtones are thus more effective than those with higher ones. Okay, Google, <laughs> And so with that, 
I'd like everyone to raise a glass, as the, as the city of Bologna still does to this day, recognizing Galvani <laughs> for his critical work with electric frog's legs. Thank you. Amazing. Also, I think Battery Made of Frog's Legs is my new band name. As you may have, no uh, as you may have noticed, Adventure Harvey is our mascot here at Odd Salon. And we encourage people to take Harvey out on adventures and let us know where they've been going. So in the last two weeks or so, Harvey has been spotted adventuring in the Panama Canal, in Barbados, preparing for that thing in the desert. Why did you boo? <laughs> um, <laughs> aw. Har Harvey's, he, he's, he's an adventurer. He can totally go to that. Uh, he's been spotted at the beach. He's been spotted in Vancouver appreciating some totemic art. Uh, this might be interesting to you conspiracy theory buffs. He's contemplating the role of the second shooter on the grassy knoll. Again, why are you booing? <laughs> okay, that was an aw, not a boo. Thank you, Steen. Uh, he has also been spotted at the White Sands National Monument. Now, if you happen to purchase or, or adopt one of these fine Adventure Harveys at our merch table, please share our adventures with us. And the easiest way to do that is hashtag Adventure Harvey on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Um, we may find your photos and give you a little shout out at Odd Salon. Tonight's Harvey is Crackpot Harvey. After intermission, we will raffle off this guy to one lucky person to take him on crackpot adventures. Uh, but in the meantime, at, at intermission, we have merch, we have glasses, stickers, mugs, more crackpot Harveys, um, and your purchase of things at the merch table help us continue what we are doing here. So, after the break, we have more pseudoscience. We have the uh, uncommon aesthetics of literal cracked pots and the nearly impossible artistic imaginings of Antonio Gaudi. So, please buy a drink, visit our merch table, join us, uh, sign up to uh, join our mailing list, and discuss the evening with us. We'll be back in 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> 